Yeah, we got to get to work. Okay, so the reason I I am glad I get to take over tonight is because last week I did a long, a relatively long show regarding Keith Ellison. They got a little bit of flack because for a variety of reasons, because everyone has elevated him to the sort of one true savior of the Democratic Party <laughs> and are refusing to engage with his, if you are refusing to engage with his flaws, and you think, considering what happened in the general election, that people would be more willing to engage with people's flaws because ignoring flaws hasn't seemed to help in the past. So I thought we would have just a little bit of a discussion tonight about one of the criticisms that were lobbed at me and the large implications of it, which is that I'm an ideological purist. And I don't think that that's a fair criticism, but we're going to hash it out tonight. Then we're going to go into uh, the unification of the left as a result of Trump, because that is another criticism that was lobbed at me, and I am nothing if not petty, so I'm going to address these things. I think there, it's an important conversation to have in the aftermath of the general election, while people are still kind of reeling from the fact that Hillary Clinton lost, even though it was a very predictable loss. So let's let's get right into it. And so, frankly, I'm going to put this out there. Ideolog ideological purism is not something I subscribe to, or I view as something that is inherently bad. So I'm, I'm writing both sides of the fence. What I do subscribe to is having moral red lines. I definitely consider certain things to be non-starters as for, for politicians. And what it seems like ideological purity is being lack of rex, uh, reflexivity in our politicians. Like the, the notion that we can legitimately expect our democratic establishment politicians, whether it be Keith Ellison or Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi, that come uh, no, okay, and say, okay, we have spent 15 minutes, because like, that's all it would take, really. Let's be honest. 15, we've spent 15 minutes thinking about why we lost in our election. And we've come to these conclusions. And so based on these conclusions we've come to, we have decided to not run candidates. And of course, that includes us. But instead, you know, they seem to this this is another decentralization of the this is another decentralization of the politician. This is it, it's somehow purist to say booze. So maybe they should instead they just want to sh continue to shift the burden onto the voters. They want to continue to say, well, listen, if X calls you to not vote for us, then you should stop considering X to be a moral red line. You should simply Except that we're not going to change, and therefore you should come to us. This is, you know, this is this sort of this narrative of everyone who does not accept the establishment position that you have to have money in politics, you have to have a lot of corporate donors in politics, you have to sort of play this inside game where you are you are espousing the Russia narrative, you are, you know, excusing Hillary Clinton for all her personal faults, you are blaming everything on sexism and racism. If you're not doing those things, you're a purist or you're a white nationalist or you're a pseudo Trump supporter because you're not that doing those things is how you fight Trump adequately. I mean, do you have any ideas on this, Nick? Yeah, I want to come in and, and point out something They're They're lobbying, you know, something called purism, but notice what they're doing. They're saying, if you don't think like they do, if you don't accept what they accept, somehow you, something's wrong with you. And you're being unrealistic and all your all your issues and interests and things that you hold dear, all of that has to be subjugated to what they want. You know, that's in its that that in itself is a form of ideological purity, if you ask me. Maybe not necessarily purity, maybe more like they're putting their interests and their ideology on a pedestal and they want you to leverage your support for them for nothing in exchange. And I think Yvette Carnell says this a lot. She goes, politics is an exchange. And, and I really do agree with her pushing that message because it is. I don't support someone without getting something in return. So if neoliberalism expects me to support it, it must give me something, you know, you know something uh, requisite of that support, right? So what I mean by that is, if you want me to sign on to something, you should be willing to give me some reason to do so. And not just say, well, I'm not going to give you anything, but you still owe me your vote because I'm sure you agree with these things. So you need to vote for me anyway. And it's like, well, no, my main issues are these. Well, that's just unreasonable. You know, that's just unrealistic. You know, you got to give up on all those things. You know, that's just a fantasy land. And I was like, well, what's fantasy about it? it? It exists in other places. Universal health care exists in other places. These, I mean, cooperatives 
competing against uh, corporations. They exist in other places. People that actually deal with corporate corruption, it's actually done in other places. None of this stuff is a fantasy. You know, none of this stuff is really like make believe and you just can't do it. But the idea that where we are today is is the last destination, is the best we can do. They want to push that forward because they want to maintain things. They want to keep us here. So they want to Sorry, basically Nicole. absorb you into a into a, do- a system dominated by their ideology and give you nothing for it. And then if you don't agree with it, you're a fringe and there's something wrong with you. Well, I mean, we have to talk about that. And that's a really big problem on the left. And I think you identified it very well, is that the left, uh, one of, uh, the huge hobgoblin of the left is this pseudo intellectualism, and one of the manifestations of that pseudo intellectualism that that is that just troubles the minds of the elite leftists on the coast cities and in the pundit class, and you know, is this idea of maturity that there's something mature about preemptive compromise, that there's something you know mature about being recklessly civil. Like, because let's be honest, the left, the people who like a lot of liberals succumb to reckless civility, they. They want to compromise. They want to meet you halfway, regardless of where your starting point is. They they they, they define themselves. They they define the halfway mark by where your starting point is, and they don't they don't want you to. They don't want the opposition to come to them. They want where they want their theoretical supporters to come to them, as opposed to going to them. And they, and 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 I, and I I've, I'm forced to bring this back to Bernie Sanders, and I and, I, and we talk about him a lot, and I'll, you know it gets us a lot of flack, but I do I do wish he would have run as a third party. And I know a lot of people say, well, he made the deal that he wouldn't run as a third party candidate. He made the deal. And, and I was like, Anna, he should have broke that deal. And like, 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 if that's what the deal he had to make when he got in, like, you know, if you if that that's one thing. But they changed the rules before he did. And like, and like to make to make that deal and then keep that deal at the expense of the American people, like the expense of a lot of his supporters, that wasn't the mature thing to do. Like that really wasn't the adult thing to do, and I, and this is not meant to like consider him immature or or immature or uh, a sellout because he's not a sellout. He has his values, he has his goals, he has his X, Y, and Z. But I don't think that he should be elevated to the position of radical leader that he is not. He's like he's very, he's very much you know from a global standpoint moderate in his beliefs. I, I never heard him espouse a, a universal basic income. I never heard like, any of these things from him. And that's not to say that he had to because like I, for where he was, I was willing to be at for this election. But it, the like the left's obsession with these with maturity and ideological nihilism is is it's too much. Let me let me let me come in on there too. You know, I was talking with someone over the weekend about this and, um, you know, what they told me was, well, you know, I, I, I sort of like Bernie Sanders, you know, but I, I just really wish he wouldn't have did this and that. And I was like, well, it was just a sign of his weakness. And they say, well, you know, it's not really weakness. He just he just made a bargain or whatever. I was like, well, who deals with scoundrels and keeps their word? Like when a scoundrel has cheated you, the deal is void. Like it, it, you no longer have to keep that. Truth be told, when you're dealing with scoundrels, you should expect a double cross, a double cross to begin with, and you shouldn't have any intention of keeping your word regardless. And 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 that whole mythical, well, you know, when they go low, we go high, and all that. That's all just BS. Like we, we're in here playing to win, you know. And this is not about process; it's about outcome and result. And to be honest with you, the left would have never been stronger than when they decided to break from the Democratic Party, and it cost them, and it cost them an election. The left will be strong at that point because now, guess what? You have to pay attention to them. You have to give them policy. You are no longer in control of the left. There is a force that actually has more votes than you do, per se, right? That I mean, and, and the whole idea that the left runs away from being the reason why the Democrats have lost an election is wrong. We should be embracing that because that means you have power. 